Greetings, my fellow Americans, and welcome to another episode of the Great Montana Conspiracy Podcast. If you like the content that I'm speaking of, by all means, please go to my YouTube channel, the Great Montana Conspiracy Podcast, like and subscribe, and by all means, share it. Of course, as always, the original content for this material can be found on monspiracy.podbean.com, but liking and subscribing on YouTube gives us the extra boost and exposure that we need to get our message out. Again, if you like our information, share our information. Anyone watching the last two videos, the last two episodes of this podcast, will know what tonight's subject is. Tonight is the conclusion to a three-part topic on the subject of justice. As before, I'm giving a nod to Clark Niley, who is a senior VP, uh, Vice President for Legal Studies at Cato Institute, which is a libertarian think tank. I am in no way endorsing libertarianism. I'm in no way endorsing K the Cato Institute, nor for that matter, I'm really endorsing Clark Niley in any capacity other than the fact that he's been an inspiration for this particular series. I started out with an idea of justice to define it, to frame it, to demonstrate how perverted it has become. And when I was doing my research, I came across Clark Niley's article, which again, the link should be attached to this video. If it's not, please visit monspiracy.podbean.com to get the full text and the link to, the, to his article, as well as, of course, over on YouTube, we'll also have the content there. Now, as we've discussed in the previous videos, or as I've discussed in the previous videos, in the previous two episodes, nothing exists to thwart the corruption of the prosecutors in the courts. Nothing. We have pretense, but there's nothing really that stops them. As I explained in the last video, even the United States Supreme Court has come back and said it's perfectly legitimate for a prosecutor to lie, manipulate, cheat, threaten, intimidate, terrorize an individual who's going through the system in order to comp compel them to take a plea deal. It's acceptable. It's a crime to anybody else, but it's, the United States Supreme Court has come back and said it's legal. It's authorized. It's justified. And they keep... Therefore, there's nothing restraining because the highest court in the land has said it's appropriate. The plea bargain system, just to be clear, is an unconstitutional monstrosity. The constitutional framework is the, the jury trial. People are faced with threat every day if they take their case to trial. Why? Because prosecutors, one, can't possibly prosecute every case they charge. They can't. They can't afford it. They would bankrupt the entire government system. Their method of operations would come to a halt. But more importantly, they don't have to work at it. They literally don't have to work at it. All they have to do is just fluff it up, make it sound like a good threat, and then terrorize the person and taking a plea deal. They never have to worry about proving it in front of a jury. When you have no basis or burden for what you're doing, it's really easy to do your job and just throw people in prison. Clark Niley called it uh, point and, and convict. And I think it's an excellent term. I love the term because it's so, so abundantly true. But it's, and I've discussed this previously when I've talked about immunity, both qualified immunity, absolute immunity, but it, it bears repeating. Judges and, pro and prosecutors have an immunity scale that nobody else has. They are literally untouchable 99% of the time. They can act inappropriately. They can lie. They can deceit. They can even withhold information. They can manufacture and create false information. They can even testify under oath falsely and still not be held accountable. There are departments within the governments. In Montana, it's the Montana, uh, it's the Montana Judicial Standards Commission and the uh, Montana Bar Association. Well, the actual, the, the subdivision of the, of the Montana Bar Association is the uh, Commission on Practice. But nevertheless, these are the bodies that are supposed to enforce these. These are where complaints are sent to, but they're confidential, which I'll go into um, in depth a little bit further into this podcast. But, I mean, as I've detailed in previous videos, the bar to approach the ability to, pre to breach the immunity, to breach the ability to call these prosecutors out for their misconduct, their misbehavior, their, their criminal conduct. 
the bar is so high it, it can't be attained most of the time. Even the United States Supreme Court has barred the approach to, to has barred the, even the consideration of prosecutorial vindictiveness in a plea bargain situation. The, the Supreme Court has forbidden it to even be considered. You cannot consider this to be a vindictive situation if it's in a plea bargain because, quote, the defendant has the ability to withdraw, to approve, to agree, or decline the offer. No, no, you don't. That, that's the whole point of compulsion is that, yeah, someone's holding a gun to your head. Sure, you have the ability to not give them your wallet. Or you can sit there and be shot and die and face the consequences of turning them down. So at what point is do you have a choice? You're in jail, you're facing the rest of your life in prison, possibly 10 years, 20 years, whatever the penalty they're threatening you with, if you don't go along with them. And they will punish you for your exercising your constitutional right to a trial. So at what point is it not compulsory? What point do you do it? Do you have a choice? Like I said, you hold a gun to someone's head and say, give me all your money. That person has a choice. Sure they do. They don't have to give the wallet. Therefore, it's not a crime. It's not a crime because the person could say, no, I don't have to give you my wallet. That's the rationale of the United States Supreme Court. That because the defendant has a right to say no and can withdraw and decline an offer made to him, that's not compulsion. That's not illegal. That's not intimidation. It absolutely is. And these judicial officials and these prosecutors have no consequence. Therefore, justice cannot prevail. Justice must always require the pursuit of truth. And, and let me say that again. Justice requires the pursuit of of truth. If you're not pursuing the truth, there can be no justice. Justice requires that an individual face consequences for their actions. But if their actions didn't happen, and if they if prosecutors and judges have to lie, manipulate, and scheme to frame a story, to create a fabrication, to distribute and and, and vocalize propaganda. There is no truth, there's, and therefore, there's no justice. If Jim Bob, and I haven't talked about Jim Bob in a while, but if Jim Bob shoots his wife, Jim Bob, why'd you do that? Seriously, if Jim Bob shoots his wife, and his wife dies, Jim Bob absolutely deserves to be face justice for his conduct. However, if he comes home and finds his wife dead from a gunshot wound, Justice requires him to be found innocent because he didn't do anything. He came home and found the dead body. But if a prosecutor decides, hey, I'm going to go ahead and I want to make a career for myself. I want to build my jacket. I want to build my reputation. I want to pursue my political ambitions. Or I just want more money for my county and for people incarcerated. Whatever their motivation, their reasoning is. If they take it upon themselves to create the evidence to show that Jim Bob killed his wife, even if he just came home and found her, and he's convicted of a crime he didn't commit, there is no justice. Justice requires pursuit of truth. Our criminal, our so-called criminal justice system does not do that. It does not pursue the truth. It pursues prosecution. Prosecution does not require proof. It doesn't require truth. It only requires that you can convince either a jury or a judge that what the story you want them to believe is credible enough to convict the person. That's it. There is, there's no other boundary. There's no other boundary except that you simply have to convince someone else. And then oftentimes, it's not even a matter of convincing them because they don't need to believe it. It's to be afraid not to. Or in the case of your, if you've got a judge, the judge just wants to go along and cooperate. Because remember, these guys are friends. They're all attorneys. They've always practiced together. These are not, 99% of the time, they're not people who are strangers. And even if they are, they're part of the same cabal. And, I, and I've referenced this before about how attorneys are all part of one large, massive, infiltrative organization that are loyal, first and foremost, to themselves. Lawyers are judges. Judges are lawyers. 
lawyers are prosecutors. Many people in positions of government are, pro are lawyers, are attorneys. They are part of this cabal that secretly manipulates and operates our government. Now, am I saying they sit down around a shadow covenant and make all the unilateral decisions? No, I'm not saying anything like that. I'm not pitching the idea that we're dealing with a massively controlling, you know, high Pumbaa running everything with a secret coven of 12 who run around in masks and hoods and meet in the middle of the night and, and pass secret laws and directives to the rest. No, I'm not talking about that. This is nothing like, you know, the old conspiracy ideas of, of the Illuminati or stuff like that. But the fact remains, you have people who are like-minded, who are in pursuit of their own ambitions and the pursuit of protecting their own field because it protects them individually. They have a inherent conflict of interest because they have loyalty to each other. They have loyalty to their own field. They have loyalty to their own ambitions, their own rights. And everything that they motivate toward is where the laws govern and direct. And this is why having lawyers in government are so dangerous because they are an organized collective cabal. And that makes them dangerous. But if they're not required, to, if they're held to no boundaries to pursue truth, then these people are not in the pursuit of justice. They are in the pursuit of their own ambitions. They certainly aren't in the pursuit of the American ideal of a dream. As I mentioned in the previous videos, these very people are the ones responsible for the overcriminalization of of the justice system. The criminal justice system is not supposed to be worried about things like whether you smoke pot, whether you're, whether you uh, trespass onto somebody's lawn in the middle of the night. Honestly, it's not supposed to worry about whether you raise your voice and scream downtown, or whether you're wandering around drunk unless you hurt someone. And there's the issue. It's called the harm factor. In order to effectively, in a liberal democracy, in order to effectively fall within the criminal justice system, you have to commit a crime against the social welfare in such a way that it harms the fabric of society. In other words, you have to cause harm to somebody else. Cause harm. That's a really important issue. It's a really important, and I'll deal with that in just a little bit. But it's a really important point I want you to keep in mind. In order to pursue justice in a liberal democracy, it must be against people who have committed crimes where there is a victim of the crime. Or you have caught where they have caused harm to somebody. This broad range of laws that we have, it's it's untenable. It's not appropriate. It's it's just an excuse to have somebody to throw people in jail, to throw people in prison, and to find them, to get money from them, to milk money from them, and to build the power of the cabal that runs our government. And once again, not talking about a secret society that sits around in robes and hoods and meets in secret in secret dark mansions or in basements or cellars or whatever else. Not talking about sacrificing virgins to the to, you know to the moon. I'm talking about a group of people who are like minded, who have an outside organization and influence, and they have they have their interest. They have an interest in a common goal, and that common goal extends beyond the government and their interests to the people of the country. Those people are the ones who are deciding what to do. And they are, hey, if, if a little is good, a lot must be better, right? That's their philosophy. If a little criminal prosecution is good, then maybe a lot is better because it gives people, first of all, A, it cowers the populace. It makes the people afraid. And if they're afraid, they're looking for people to protect them. And second, it empowers them. It gives them money in their pockets. It gives them ambition, influence. It gives them, you know, the ability to stand above the law and not face consequences for their own misconduct. Which, once again, falls down to the quality, the quality of protection these officials maintain. I, and I want to talk about, when I, I said a minute ago that crimes require victims. And I know there are, people love to use the term victimless crime. This is a victimless crime. Hollywood loves loves to do this. Hollywood will say um, video piracy is a vi is not a victimless crime because it hurts the pocketbooks of the producers, the individuals who actually make the videos, books, plagiarism, the same aspect. It hurts the industry 
as a whole. Well, that's not what a victim is. A victim is somebody who is hurt directly by criminal conduct or hurt in some capacity directly. Using the definition the movie industry wants you to believe that video piracy is a, is a victimless crime holds to that anybody whose pocketbook, salary, wages, whatever, if you go to court as a juror and you lose wages because you go there or you have to pay gas money to get there, you're now a victim because you were financially affected by this crime, even if you weren't the subject or the target of the crime. So using the word victimless crime, it's not appropriate. A better model is to say that it's not harmless. Video piracy is not harmless. It does cause harm. It does not create victims. And that's how these a lot of these people try to get around the idea that in a liberal democracy, there must be a victim of the crime. Well, the victim of the crime would be the person who might be hurt. And if there's no one actually being hurt by a crime, it is a victimless crime. There is no victim. It doesn't mean no one is being harmed by it, by the conduct or the behavior. But it does mean it's, it is victimless. And that's an important aspect for, for our argument here, that justice requires that there be a victim. It requires someone to actually face consequences. Now, video piracy... Not a fan of it. Not believe in it. I'm a writer. I constantly deal with plagiarism. I constantly deal with people who steal my copyright my, and, and steal my, my books and distribute them all over the internet. So yes, i very much opposed to infringement of civil liberties. However, they are not criminal issues. They are civil torts. If I find someone infringing upon my civil rights, I don't get to go to a to a uh, a lawyer or a prosecutor or a law enforcement officer and say, "Hey, this person stole my work." If you have, if you're the movie industry, you can. But I can't. I don't have the influence. I don't have the clout to do that. But I can pursue them in civil court. There are laws that allow for the pursuit and reimbursement and cost of damages I have suffered. That's what that system exists for. It should not be something that the federal government should be enforcing or the state government should be enforcing. It's not a crime under a liberal democracy because it has no victim. If somebody steals my book, distributes it over the internet, am I affected? Absolutely. Do I think that person belongs in jail under a criminal prosecution? No, I do not. They should be fined. They should be... If they, if they defy a court order and decide to, you know, if the court order orders them to reimburse me and pay me and they don't, they can be held in contempt. But that's a different issue. That's not the actual plagiarism or the, or the infringement of copyright. That's just the aspect of they defied a court order. And that breaks down to the how it affects society. If, if the court is powerless to enforce its own orders and if it cannot deliver consequence or punishment to people who do so, then the courts have no power and authority and heck cannot do anything. So contempt is appropriate. Violation of a copyright is not for criminal pursuit. But the problem is, and, and this is where we get back to the subject of the justice, is these prosecutors and law enforcement attorneys, they lie all the time. And they are allowed to, as I mentioned in my last video, there's actually many circumstances in which the high courts, both the appellate courts and the U.S. Supreme Court, have ordered the lower courts, they forbid them to even consider whether criminal misconduct occurred. And when they don't forbid it, they make the barrier to, to demonstrate it so high it can't be achieved. This should not be a, a, a struggle. This should not be a, a test of whether or not you meet the criteria to be a Harvard year one um, recipient of a grant. You sh we shouldn't be worrying about whether or not you can apply for, you know, a nuclear, um, a nuclear uh, reactor grant to build a nuclear reactor in your backyard. It should be a lot harder, a lot harder to obtain, but not the pursuit of holding someone accountable under law for their, for their misconduct, especially if they are a government official. It should be easier. Remember, the burden of all of this is supposed to lie with the state. 
but they've twisted it around. They've turned it around. The, the state's not, doesn't have a burden at all. They can do whatever they want without consequence. Most of the time. The laws exist, but the laws only have power if they're enforced and they're allowed to happen. Yes, it's illegal to intimidate someone, to harass, to terrorize, to coerce someone into doing something they otherwise would not do it without being under threat. If it's you or I. But the government must be held to the same standard, if not to a higher standard, because they are appointed and to represent us. They are hired to represent us. They are hired to represent the, the dignity and respect of the office they are holding. They are expected to represent us in an honest and fair capacity. They're not being honest if they're lying, cheating, stealing, fabricating, manipulating, terrorizing, harassing. They're not. Prosecutors are so hell-bent to convict. They ignore evidence and create their own stories, their own versions of events, just to create the crime, just to create it. The conse consequences are supposed to exist, but they're incredibly rare to be, to, to be enforced or to even act upon them. Worse, they're confidential. If you do bring a complaint against the prosecutor, if you do bring a complaint against the judge, the, and again, I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit more in more depth in a few minutes, you can't, there, you can't find out if somebody's brought a complaint against them because it's considered confidential. So you don't even know if other people have complained against them. Are you a lone wolf in the, in the darkness trying to make a complaint? Or does this person have like 800 other people out there who are making similar complaints? How do you know? You don't because it's confidential. I know someone right now, I just got told about her case here a few days ago. She's in federal custody here in Montana. She was arrested under a conspiracy charge. I'm not going to talk about the specifics because I don't have her consent to actually speak about her case, but I'm going to talk in generalities. But she was, she was arrested and she's being held under a conspiracy charge. There is no evidence. The federal agents reviewed her phone in advance without any warrant. They held her in a car for three hours, driving her around, interrogating her. And then after all this, after they looked at her phone, after they got all the information they, they wanted, then they went and got a warrant, supposedly. Now, keep in mind, she's never even been provided the warrant. They claim the warrant exists. They've never provided it. They've ignored the, the, the requirement of Brady Law to produce, the, to produce the, the evidence. This warrant may not even exist. But... Regardless, they haven't produced it. But they obtained the warrant after they went through and got the information. Because, and they, then they filled the, the gaps in their own story, in their own version of events, in order to create the prosecution. Now she's in, in prison, or in jail. She's being shuffled between one jail site and another, as they're trying to coerce her and threaten her into taking a plea deal, so that she doesn't face a harsher penalty if she goes before a jury. And she didn't do anything. She literally did nothing. They just want to find someone to prosecute. And so they're prosecuting her and they've made up this story. And now she's in jail, could be facing federal time, all because the prosecutors are not bound by the integrity of truth. They're not. There's no, there's no pursuit of justice here. It's only a pursuit of ambition and, quite frankly, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And when the authorities have no actual, genuine oversight or accountability, they're absolutely corrupt. And that's where they go. That's where they end up. When you have a situation like what I, what I just described, or you have any situation where an individual is simply picked up, thrown in jail with very little requirement, a little, a very little effort, the, bar the barriers that protect against infringement of civil liberty are gone. Under the federal standards right now, under what's called speedy trial, and I really need to do a subject on speedy trial. Maybe I'll do that one next. I don't know yet. But I really need to do a topic on speedy trial. But just as a very brief overlay, right now the federal guidelines are six months for a misdemeanor, nine months for a felony, which means nine months of your life you're in prison or in jail until you can face trial, assuming you don't waive your speedy trial rights or the state doesn't 
violate them in some way. Nine months at least on a felony charge. That's not speedy, but the problem is during that nine months, they get to change the story, they get to manipulate, they get to terrorize, they get to intimidate, they get to do whatever they want to do to coerce that person to take a plea deal. And if not, they can threaten other people in their lives to get them to do the same thing. Remember, all major prosecutions of law enforcement, as we've seen them in our country over the last several decades, have been because of video evidence. Rodney King, we just saw Floyd, we just, we've seen so many situations and circumstances where people's, or the body cameras get released. Video evidence is incredibly valuable. But you don't have that with prosecutors and judges. You don't have video evidence of them committing major crimes. Most people wouldn't even understand it if they saw it. It's very obvious to see police officers striking somebody with a baton or kneeling on the back of somebody's neck. Those are very visibly obvious. If you don't understand law and you don't understand how a court system works or that something a judge is doing is improper or that something a prosecutor is doing is improper, you don't have the basis for which to make a judgment call, even if someone did videotape it and bring it forward. You don't have the capacity to prove it because most people wouldn't understand what they saw. It's not an obviously visible thing. If you have a flat tire, it is very obvious you have a flat tire. If you have a car that, that won't turn on, not as obvious. You have to understand how the mechanics of the car work. You might be able to see if the car is broken. It's not starting, it's not going anywhere. But you don't know what's causing it, and you don't know if that's right or wrong. Is it a natural thing? Did somebody sabotage it? Did somebody pour sugar in the gas tank? What? You don't know. If you don't know cars, if you don't know the system or circumstances, you can't make that decision. And therefore, even if we did have the capacity to videotape prosecutors and judges doing wrong things, we aren't going to be able to get the, the vast majority of public to recognize that what they're seeing is an actual visible wrong. It's simply not simple enough. It's complex, and complex issues simply are not, don't trigger the same results that seeing something that's immediately perceived as wrong does. But how many crimes, knowing that, that video evidence is responsible for so many of these issues coming up, how many of these crimes are not recorded? What would have happened if Floyd had, I mean, when, when Floyd was the original police department report, when Floyd was killed, was that an incident occurred that a, a suspect died while, you know, in police custody? Didn't specify how, didn't put any blame on the officers, didn't do anything. It simply said a suspect has died while in custody. It was a nameless, unidentified, if it had not been for the viral videos that had gone out surrounding that issue, Floyd's story would have fallen between the cracks. How many millions of cases every year does that happen? And because of confidentiality issues, again, truth, you have to pursue truth. And if you can't even talk about it, you can't have truth. There's no truth to be told if you can't even speak about it. And in many cases, the disciplinary records of both prosecutors, law enforcement, judges, they're confidential. You, they don't, you don't get to talk about them. It's difficult to say how many complaints are made annually when almost universally they're considered to be confidential. For instance, by law or practice, police departments are not compelled to share their complaints made against their officers. In 23 states, Montana included, the laws of the state state that police records are confidential. Okay, they're confidential. You can't even publish a police report legally. You can't, even if it's a, a you, it's about you. Even if it's talking about you, it's your case, it's your circumstances, your situations. You cannot legally take a police report and publish it in a newspaper. You can't. It's illegal. In 15 of our states, some situations only dealing with the most severe cases that are allowed, in 15 of our states, it's limited. It's a limited access. Minor issues, my, minor complaints might be able to be um, covered up or less, what they consider lesser issues, issues that are not pursued, that are not prosecuted, that are not, um, do not lead to disciplinary action. For instance, if the officer kneeling on Floyd's back, he was not initially punished. There's no citation. There's nothing on record. 
if it wasn't for the video evidence, the, the record of him murdering George Floyd would not be accessible by public record because there would never have been a complaint made against him. There would never have been a citation. There would have been no discipline. There's no nothing. Therefore, the complaint would not exist because the, because the police department wasn't under any obligation or mandatory compulsion to do so. So when records are con or when records are confidential, sorry, and just, just to be clear, there are actually 12 states that list, that, that do state that the records are uh, public. However, even in the cases of the states where they're public, they're subject to restrictions. Oftentimes, once again, if it's only a complaint that does not lead to disciplinary action, they're not reported. So if you say this officer, this, if an officer comes into your house, holds a gun to your head, threatens to put, puts the gun in your mouth, pulls back the trigger, terrorizes you, threatens you, you call in a complaint on this. The officer's never disciplined. You don't ever show up in a public record search. Because in some of those states, even the ones that are public, if, it, if the disciplinary report or the report does not lead to disciplinary action, there's no record. You can't access it unless there's a discipline action taken against the officer. So if the of his fellow officers protect and shelter him from consequence, there's no record. Because of, con I mean, even, it's, it's just, it's impossible to consider how many instances actually are out there that that's never been shown a light. And in many cases where the states consider them confidential, you're not even allowed to publicly talk about them. You're barred from speaking about them. The worst part about it is that though there are laws in some states which allow for production of disciplinary actions against law enforcement, no such laws exist for prosecutors or judges. Again, prosecutors and judges are attorneys and therefore their, prosecute, their, their complaints are made to the Commission on Practice for Attorneys and the Judicial Standards Commission for Judges and any complaints made to either one of those departments in Montana or any other state I've been able to find. I've not been able to find a single exception to this, by the way. If you make a complaint to one of these bodies, these overseeing bodies that oversee the, the prosecutors or oversee the judges, you are required by virtue of making the complaint to not disclose. In fact, you have to sign a statement when you make the complaint that you agree not to disclose even the existence of the complaint. You can't tell someone I made a complaint against this against this judge because if you do, you're in violation of, of it and you can actually be held in contempt. You can be the criminal for even talking about it. I remember th these are these are <laughs> With the exceptions of the federal judicial officers who have lifetime appointments, these are elected officials. You're supposed to be able to know what they're doing in their offices. And the ones that aren't elected are appointed. They And they, they have a public accountability. But they, if there's no accountability because, guess what? You don't get to learn what they do. You don't get to know what wrongs they've done or what they've been accused of. You can't possibly make a proper decision. Because of the confidentiality, oversight of these committees face no pressure whatsoever to actually come down on the people they're being complained against. There's no public outcry. There's no public uprising. There's no anything. There's no letter campaigns written to the editorial office. There's nothing because they are considered confidential and you can't even speak about them. And therefore, the body, whether it be the Commission on Practice or the Judicial Standards Commission, are under no obligation to disclose the, the complaint even exists, so how do you know to protest it? And you, the person who files it can't legally go out there and tell people to protest against it because they've agreed by virtue of making the complaint to not say anything, even to acknowledge the complaint exists. So what point? Where? What are we supposed to do? We can't even know what these people are doing in office because they've protected themselves and barricaded themselves behind their own oversight. Once again, foxes guarding the foxes who are eating the chickens. But judges and prosecutors, these are elected officials. If the electorate can't be informed of the misconduct or, or wrongdoings that these people do in office, how can they ever make a decision about whether to reelect them or not? There's no voter check and balance. There's no 
individuals. There's, it's not a democracy. It's not a republic. It's nothing. It's totalitarianism. As I've mentioned before, judges in, my, in, in Flathead County, they don't even have to, they, they, don't, they never have anyone run against them. Because as far as the electorate is concerned, these, these guys are in office. They're perfect job duties, perfect job descriptions, never anything wrong. They're doing a fantastic, wonderful job because they've never anything done wrong. They've never done anything wrong. They've done everything right. Because it's not allowed to be talk about their, their complaints, about things they have done wrong. And people who do speak out against them can be retaliated against because, once again, you can't prove retaliation if you can't even discuss what they're retaliating against you for. If I file a complaint against Judge Albright, Judge Albright is free to retaliate against me because I can't discuss that I filed something against her. So I can't even bring up a retaliation claim. Yeah, she retaliated against me for what? I'm not allowed to say. You're not allowed to say or not. I can't, I can't say it. Legally, I can't say it. I can't say what she's retaliating against me for. She's retaliating against me. I can't say what for. How does that ever stand up anywhere? It doesn't. Because if you can't give the reason, you can't dot the I's and cross the T's, if you can't connect the dots, you don't get to prove a claim in court. And this is, they set up this where it's an impossible barrier to breach. Think about what I said earlier. A major reason most misconduct law enforcement has been because of videos. The internal checks and balances do not work for law enforcement. They don't work for judges. They don't work for prosecutors. They don't work for the justice system. They're allowed to police their own ranks. There's no possibility for a prosecutor or a judge to be held accountable or to be held in check from pursuing and coercing people to, to make up lies about themselves just to not be punished worse than they are already being punished. Where is justice when the officials and the administration, they get to administer, ju administer justice but have no accounting to justice themselves? They have no accountability. They have no, oversight, no, no real direct oversight. It's all a pretense. So where is justice? Once again, justice requires the pursuit of truth. You cannot possibly, possibly pursue truth if you don't have, if, if you're not even permitted to speak. If you're not even allowed to talk out about the injustice or the complaints you've made or the things that these people have done wrong. And the irony is, I can go out and I can say today, Judge Albright did this, that, and the other. Okay, well, the, the, the virtue to do that, to do something about that is to make a Judicial Standards Commission complaint. But the moment I make that complaint, I can't talk about it anymore. I can't even say, okay, I, I'll go do that and then do it and confirm I did it because I'm in violation, I'm in contempt. How does any of that make sense? One of my favorite quotes of all time comes from uh, Robert Heinlein, science fiction author. I, I quote this all the time. It comes from a 1940 story, short story he wrote. It's called If This Goes On. But it says, When any government, or any church for that matter, undertakes to say to its subjects, This you may not read, this you must not see, this you are forbidden to know, the end result is tyranny and oppression, no matter how holy the motives. I've just demonstrated to you a circumstance and a situation to where an entire body of government has made it impossible to publicize critiques about them, criticisms about them, complaints about them. You may not read the complaint. You must not see the complaint. You're forbidden even to know the complaint exists. The end result is tyranny and oppression. We have inherited a system that calls itself justice. But in fact, it's completely opposite of what it claims to be. There is no justice in a system that doesn't pursue truth, that doesn't pursue the defense of liberal democracy. That's about enforcing ideals and morals of, a, of an elite select group of people. I talked previously in a previous video about uh, the legalization of marijuana or about marijuana crimes versus violent statistical crimes according to the federal uh, the FBI's annual reports. 
I've also talked about how we're getting ready to legalize pot, marijuana, whatever you want to call it, cannabis, on the 1st of January. The state government does not want it legalized. They don't want people out using marijuana. They don't want people out using it. They want to continue to be able to prosecute because they make a ton of money. So now the, the voters have passed a, a memorandum that says, and a referendum that says you must make it legal. Now they're, they're creating this massive tax. It, it's, it, alcohol and tobacco are already out there. They're already being taxed. Some would argue those, are, those taxes are too high. Marijuana looks very much like it's going to be three to four times the taxes on, mar on, on alcohol and tobacco. And keep in mind, the rationality behind these taxes has always been that the state has to assume medical care for these individuals later in life. They have emphysema, bad liver, whatever. The state often bears the burden of the health care of these individuals because of their addictions. It's been an off, an off time argument that's been made to justify the taxation. The truth is they just want money and they're, ta they're taking advantage of people's, people's addictions to make money off of it. Well, now they have an institution they are going to make far less money off of the prosecution of marijuana, so now they're going to turn around and make sure they make it back up by taxing it. And they're going to tax it so heavily they're hoping that people will not be able to afford it and it'll fall by the wayside. And that's possible. They could people could end up going to other states to get their get their uh, marijuana. They they could go to you know, if it's legal, they could actually pop, they could shop around and find a place that is able to get it cheaper. Maybe someone who grows it on their own. Uh, possession is is not going to be an issue anymore. The growing probably is going to be the production outside their their uh, taxable structure will be. But once again, this is not supposed to be criminal justice inside a liberal democracy. There's no crime if there's no victim. I don't smoke marijuana. I don't do drugs. I don't smoke nicotine. I don't drink. These are my personal choices. But I think everyone is entitled to do what they want to do with their lives. If they want to drink, let them drink. If they want to smoke pot, let them smoke pot. If they want to shoot up with meth, let them shoot up with meth. So long as they don't hurt other people when they do so when they are under the influence. As I've said before, I'm a very strong believer in DUIs. Driving under the influence puts people at risk of harm. But if you want to drink at home, drink at home. If you want to smoke, smoke your, your bowl at home, smoke your bowl at home. I commend you, I, I encourage you, I endorse you doing so. Just don't put it as a risk when you do it. At that point, it crosses into defense of the liberal democracy. But at the end of the day, we have to recognize that we can't use the word justice to describe what we're going through here. Because this is not pursuit of a liberal democracy. This is pursuit of something that's completely perverted from that idea. So long as we cannot know, so long as we're subjected to this, this horrific abuse of process, this horrific overcriminalization of laws. So long as prosecutors and judges are unbound by the capacity to lie, they can do whatever they want in the pursuit of the so-called justice system, there can be no justice. And that needs to change. Once again, if you like my video, if you like my content, you like the message I'm sending out there, please, by all means, support us. Like and subscribe to me over on YouTube, The Great Montana Conspiracy Podcast. And as always, as I say at the end of these videos, whenever possible, please be safe. And most importantly, please be free. Thank you.